Good afternoon, everybody. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, warm welcome on behalf of Aston Romania and Aston Institute Germany to today's um, Ambassador's Talk series. Um, just a few words from Aston Romania on my side, and then we should start the conversation with our two distinguished guests today. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of Aston Romania for today's edition of the Ambassador's Talk series. My name is Mirela Apostol. I'm leading the public programs here at Aston Romania. Uh, the Ambassador's Talk series today uh, will discuss current relations between Romania and Germany, approached especially from the angle of European security priorities. Before delving into today's discussion, I would like to particularly thank uh, the Aspen Institute Germany and Dr. Stormy Annika Milner for the invitation addressed to Aspen Romania to join the Ambassador's Talk uh, event, a long-term and well-established project that Aspen Germany leads in order to promote the diplomatic work of ambassadors in countries where Aspen Institutes are already established and healthy international cooperation. A uh, few words on Aspen Romania. Since 2006, the Institute has been um, keen to foster values-based leadership in the region and to encourage individuals to reflect and act in accordance with the ideas and concepts that define a good society. Um, Aspen Romania has also ever since been a major public convener in our country and in the region. We are hosting each year important international public events in Bucharest and abroad. We cover a wide range of public policy debates and important issues on both national and international levels. Uh, it is thus since 2006 that Aspen Romania also belongs to the global network of international partners of the Aspen Institute US. And we are more than ever proud and thankful for the opportunities to engage in such high level events and debates as today, working with Aspen Institutes around the world. Today's event, as already presented, is realized at the initiative of Aspen Institute Germany and in partnership, of course, with Aspen Romania. Uh, and we hope it presents an important opportunity for you, our audiences, to tackle the latest in terms of um, Romania-Germany relations through an informed conversation between our um, distinguished uh, guest, Her Excellency Ambassador Adriana Loretta Stavescu, Romania's ambassador to Germany, and His Excellency Per Gebauer, Germany's ambassador to Romania. The conversation will be moderated by Dr. Stormy Annika Milner, the executive director of Aspen Germany. We are particularly honored to welcome such high-level speakers today, and I would like to particularly thank your excellencies for accepting our invitation. And it is now my pleasure to give the floor to Dr. Milner to lead the conversation further. Thank you very, very much, um, Mirella, for this wonderful introduction. Um, this is just another um, in, in, another cooperation in a, in a series of cooperations we had in the past. Um, one of them are our leadership seminars, um, where we have German participants participating in your executive leadership uh, seminar and the other way around. Um, and um, Mirella, um, your institute just uh, uh, co-coordinated um, the NATO Youth Summit um, in Miami, Brussels, Stockholm, um, and um, being viewed by many of us around the world, um, which was a huge uh, success. So you have you're so modest that you didn't mention it really, um, but it was a very, very important part um, of the NATO process towards the NATO summit. Um, and I think um, this is something to be really proud of. So congratulations. Um, this ambassador's talk is unlike some of the other events we do, um, not under Chatham House rules. So we are recording this and also putting it onto uh, YouTube afterwards, uh, just to let you know. Um, we also, in a good Aspen style, want to have a very engaging debate. <laughs> so I would love to bring in our audience um, at a certain point in our discussion. And you always can write into the chat function, but I would also love to call on you and bring you into the discussion so that we really have an Aspen style uh, debate with each other, which also requires that, that you turn on your camera. It's always so much nicer to actually see you and not look at a black, black kachel, black spot with your name on it. Um, so if you want to join us via video, that would be um, really, really wonderful. Um, as Mirella um, mentioned, um, German-Romanian uh, relationship is, is good, is sound, is, um, is 
is a pillar in uh, in the European Union. Um, but we are also facing lots of challenges. Um, we are facing internal challenges um, within the EU, within our respective countries, and we are certainly facing huge challenges uh, from uh, from outside. Um, most most prominently, um, Russia's war of aggression um, against Ukraine. But before we delve into all those challenges, I wanted to ask um, our two ambassadors, um, uh, sort of say a warm up question. Um, and the warm up question, um, and I, uh, we, we often do this in our ambassadors talk, is changing the lenses and perspective, so to say. And so Ambassador Gebauer, I would like to ask you first time um, you, well, when you moved um, into your new home uh, in Romania, um, what struck you as particularly interesting as novel, something which you wouldn't ha have expected when you took up the ambassadorship? Thank you so much, um, dear Sumerika and dear Mirella, for, for having me here, also together with my colleague and dear friend Adriana, for a wonderful setup. I'm looking forward to this exchange. When I came to Romania, that's uh, almost three years ago, summer 2021, and it was just before the, the big changes, the geopolitical changes that we have, uh, we have witnessed this ever since. Um, I was deeply impressed by um, Romania's um, relevance and activity and engagement both in the EU and NATO. I have to say that from a Berlin perspective, maybe German perspective, uh, the years uh, prior to the Zeitenwende that we are witnessing right now, the geopolitical changes that we are all um, facing, um, the focus of Germany has maybe not been as much on Romania as it should have been, and this has um, changed. And I'm benefiting from that. So I experienced my start here as one where Romania has uh, uh, continuously grown in, in relevance and in stature. And that's a very positive development. Thank you very much. Um, one thing we didn't talk about before we started is um, if we should go with first names. Um, in yes, Esprit please. Style? OK, that makes it so much easier. Please do. Thank you so much, Pia. Um, Adriana, what were your first thoughts when you uh, moved? Well, you, you had been in Germany before you became ambassador to Germany, but what struck you as particularly noteworthy about Germany? Noteworthy? <laughs> it's a difficult question. But first, let me thank you, uh, Stormy, and uh, all your team, Mirella in Bucharest, Tino. And uh, Alexandra, Angela, I think, or Alexandra, the colleague of Mirella. So uh, thank you very much for putting this uh, for us, for uh, giving us this framework for a public exchange, more or less. And uh, also to all the participants who uh, choose to be with us today for, for one hour. Um, you, you, know, you mentioned that I was uh, here in 2011, 2016. And uh, of course, the frame of the question, the way you frame the question is putting me in a diff very difficult situation because you know diplomats, we are used and trained to see um, the good part of it and to always search for things to be developed. But I will tell you a bit of uh, what it what it's changed in this year. So how I found uh, our relationship uh, with Germany four years uh, later. Um, uh, you know, when uh, I was here in my previous mandate, then as deputy to the ambassador, we had uh, a lot of things to struggle with, which were connected with our accession to the EU. There was a lot of uh, concern in Germany about the newcomers on the on the work labor market in, in Germany. And this um, generated some reactions which were not always seen as friendly. In the meantime, we had also um, the corona, uh, the pandemic, and uh, this also brought uh, to the forefront uh, topics which we had to, to work on. I always see, you know, things which are probably not going perfectly or not going very, very well. I see them as a motivation or as, a, you know, an, an incentive for us to do better, to try to work with each other. And I always say to my fellow Romanians, that I like, uh, I like this word in German, zusammenarbeiten, but because it means you work together. So 
in Romanian, then you say, or English, you cooperate, but it's not cooperate just as such, is you do something together. And when you do something together, it means that you can overcome an obstacle and you became friends. So this is the basis of our friendship. We, when we do uh, discover things not functioning as they should do, then we work together and we uh, make them function. And this is what I discovered when I came back to, to Romania, that the relationship improved a lot and uh, that we do have uh, a common ground to, to work even more on that. And of course, I'm you know, thrilled to, to work with Fer. We started them about at the, at about the same time. And I think we enjoy the best time of our relationship. So sorry, I cannot tell you much about what I cannot, I do not like or what's the negative part because I do not have uh, any or it's not limited. It's just it's just a, an incentive to work for them. Thank you so much. Sorry for the misunderstanding. I was actually not asking that you tell us what you like and what you disliked, um, but what was maybe surprising to you. And um, and as I take it, um, one of the things which um, which you found is that the relationship was different from five or six years ago um, and has improved. And from what we heard from Pia also, maybe something similar, that um, in the past Germany maybe didn't pay enough attention to Romania. And that has certainly very much changed over the last years. Um, before I would say that we delve into um, the geopolitics um, and the changing security environment, there is something happening going to happen in two weeks time, which is a pretty big thing. And those are the European elections. <laughs> so if I may, I would like to stay a little bit um, with the European Union, um, with the two of you, um, and um, our role and relationship within the EU. Um, so, Pia, maybe I can uh, hand over to you again. Um, the EU is a great success story, um, but not without its challenges. <laughs> um, and um, we have come a long, long way since the last um, enlargement. Um, there's still quite a lot to do with regard to integration, but we are also talking again about enlargement. But maybe you can tell us a little bit about your perception on the EU, also on Romania and the Romanian perception um, of the EU where we currently stand. I think indeed a very uh, crucial element of our work. Uh, the EU, you have rightly pointed out, is a great success story. And I think it, we need to uh, reiterate this um, as often as we can, because if you look at the EU as a phenomenon that I have at least um, uh, got to, 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 to realize, if you look at the EU at any given moment, you would always come up with a number of challenges and problems and things that might not go in the right direction or are somewhat sluggish or problematic. But if you look at the EU from the broader perspective over a number of decades, um, you will always find that what the EU has achieved is overwhelmingly positive. And we should always cherish this achievement and be proud of that. Now, where are the challenges right now? Obviously, um, we are in the midst of a, um, a, a very complex geopolitical environment with Russia's aggression, which poses a lot of, of uh, challenges also for EU. And in addition to that, we have uh, both the uh, necessity to enlarge. It's not a sign of, okay, let's be nice to somebody else and have them join. It's in our own interest to enlarge the EU and not to leave any voids. This is true for the Western Balkans. It's the same uh, with regard to the Eastern Partnership Accession Trio, so to speak. We'll talk about Georgia maybe in a minute, but um, with regard to Ukraine and Moldova. Now, um, given that the EU, uh, with a number of 27 countries, is already sometimes coming to a limit, limit in its uh, decision-making um, possibilities or capabilities, it's obvious that an enlarged EU to up to 36 members will have even more problems if we do not look at how to best make sure uh, that our ability to act is um, well kept up. And that means that we also have to reform. So parallel to the larger track, we have to reform debate, which is very, very necessary and very, very 
um, important. Now, these two things um, are uh, complementary. Uh, they have to go hand in hand. And this is what is happening right now. You will, as always in the EU, and that's a democratic institution, of course, have different opinions when it comes to details, uh, how speedily to move ahead, which reforms would be uh, good or not so good. Um, but I think and I trust you to be able to eventually come to a positive result. And at the same time, we have to make sure that we push the enlargement processes forward. That, of course, is also challenging because you need to, two to tango. Uh, it's not only that you decide who will enlarge, but you also have to have um, accession countries, candidate countries that will do the necessary reforms. And uh, so that's a complex process and it will never be a straight line. You will always have ups and downs. But I think the, the, the ship is sailing and I hope we will reach uh, safe shores uh, in due time. So these are the two, apart from the geopolitical challenges, of course, two main elements that we deal with. Um, in connection with the uh, geopolitical um, challenges to our security, of course, we need to mention also the hybrid attacks that Russia is already waging against us. Um, we are in a conflict with Russia. We are not at war, but we are in a, in a conflict that Russia has imposed on us by constantly attacking us in a hybrid form. And that has, you know, leads to the question of fake news, of um, um, all these other um, uh, efforts of Russia to disturb our inner peace, our uh, society coherence. And that, of course, is also a big challenge for the European elections, just to uh, come back to what you've said before. So let's see how these European elections will go, but um, it's challenging. Yeah. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much, Pierre. Just a quick follow-up question before I hand over to Adriana with the same question. Um, Pierre, do you see a lot of excitement for the um, European Parliament election um, on the ground? In Romania? Mm -hmm. The election here is combined with local elections, and that has a great relevance also for the upcoming elections in Romania, which is the presidential election and the parliamentary elections, uh, which will also take place this year. So the election, yes, it causes excitement, but I have to admit uh, the focus is also very much on the domestic policy relevance of these elections. Uh, and the European questions uh, might you know, also play a role, but, but let's be frank, I think this, this is a phenomenon we see in Romania, but to be frank, also in many other European countries, that the European core European issues might just be another topic besides the domestic ones. Hmm. And that's uh, maybe also one, one of the reasons why we can't say often enough how important it is to go to vote. Um, in Absolutely. <laughs> go out there and vote, people. Whoever's listening here. <laughs> yeah. no, I think our Aspen family and community and the people who are, are joining us today, I'm very sure that they are going to go to the ballot. Um, Adriana, what is your take um, on the European uh, Union and the current internal and external challenges? You know, as a Romanian, we uh, seem we tend to see the European Union a bit different because we are still a younger member of the EU. We marked the beginning of this year, 17 years of membership. And uh, this means that we are still enthusiastic and uh, because many, at least in my generation, know that we fought for and we negotiated to be there. So it we took this uh, hardship over us. So we are not just one of the members, but as I said, still new. On the other side, you know, the European Union is defined by the treaty as the union of its states and of its citizens. So it is actually the European Union is us. When we criticize Brussels, we should not criticize Brussels, but our capitals, because we do have instruments to negotiate and to influence and to put our interests on the table when it comes to the discussions in Brussels. And just, you know, as a... Um, um, as a short mentioning, of course, I, I do uh, welcome the participation in this round, uh, in this group of uh, the head of the friendship uh, parliamentary group with Germany, Romania. I saw his face here and it's a pleasure to have him there because I know that he's working on that, you know, the, the cooperation between parliaments, uh, national parliaments, working together between national and European parliamentarians. You can change a lot. We can change a lot, all of us. But we, we just have to be uh, involved and not complacent. And I think this is a message that we uh, we are, you know, it's our duty 
to repeat in any occasions. I'm doing this as an ambassador anyway, when I meet with, uh, with Romanians, because we do have uh, many Romanians in Germany, um, more than 1 million Romanian citizens uh, live in Germany currently. They, they have you know, residents, so legally re um, registered here. Mm -hmm. And we will organize uh, polling stations uh, for them. Uh, we would we will have something like so actually eighty uh, seven polling stations organized in uh, on the whole territory of Germany the largest number of polling stations that any other country is organizing in Germany and the largest that we organized so far uh, out of uh, nine hundred fifty seven if I'm not mistaken um, polling stations which are organized by Romania abroad so this shows that we also want to give a voice to our citizens. Last time uh, when we organized uh, elections in Germany at the presidential elections five years ago, this was the highest number that we reached. Then we had 150,000 participating. We hope to overcome uh, this number because they are Romanians who should uh, have their voice heard. So this is for, for me crucial that people feel that this union is theirs and they do engage with this and not just uh, stay aside and criticize. We can all criticize, but nothing is, that is getting better out of that. Um, then we've seen also in the European developments in the European talks in Brussels, we do have priorities for the next, uh, uh, for the next uh, legislative um, session of, uh, of the European part of the EU. Uh, there is the banking union, there is the implementation of the um, asylum and migration pact. So there are crucial things which uh, would have an impact on the life of, of each of us. And um, um, this, but of course, these priorities which are established at the political level need to have the backing of the European Parliament, of the government, of the national governments. So in many ways, I would say this year is a crucial year. It was a good. Um, a uh, good decision. Um, I, I think I'm saying this as a person, not necessarily as an ambassador, to put together the um, uh, European with local elections in Romania because you bring more uh, more uh, voters to the polling stations and you sort of oblige them, you know, mildly to get into acquaintance of the European, also with the European topics. At the end of the day, we know that more than 80%, some say 90% of the legislation, of the national legislation, is actually European legislation. So then we need to have our interests uh, represented there. It counts for us. So this is um, yeah, what I would uh, comment on that, only on the internal, uh, on the European affairs. And of course, I... I agree with where we do have, we do see what uh, this EU stands for when we look at our borders, when we look to Ukraine, when we look to Moldova, to, to Georgia, but also to the Balkans. So this is probably, if anyone would have questioned this before, uh, now we have uh, very much, uh, in the, we, we see very clearly what the worth of, uh, of what this EU is worth for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And I think we come back um, to the issue of enlargement um, a little later. Um, both of you started or um, assumed your ambassadorships um, in 2021. So before Russia invaded uh, Ukraine the, the second time um, and um, before the Zeitenwende really kicked in. So um, Adriana, I wanted to ask you, um, how, how were those first days? for you um, when the invasion um, it was shortly after the uh, Munich Security Conference in which I think you also participated. And uh, many, many at the conference were still saying, at least on the German side, that this isn't going to happen because it's just not rational. Um, the Americans were saying it is going to happen. Um, many Eastern European countries were saying it's going to happen and then it happened. So how, how was that? How were those first days for you? Yes, it's uh, you know it was a strange uh, a, a strange feeling in the uh, Munich Security Conference uh, two years ago. I was there. I was accompanying my uh, foreign minister at that moment, uh, and of course I accompanied him 
also to the bilateral talks we met with uh, Ukrainian Foreign Minister Kuleba, which is also now is a is the Ukrainian Foreign Minister and very well, very present in, in many debates. And we also talked at that time uh, at length with the uh, Deputy Secretary General Mircea Joana, who is coming from Romania. So we all knew what what we were talking about. There was there were the informations um, in the public, the information which was um, uh, put at disposal by the, the American uh, by the CIA. So it, there was nothing concealed at the time. It was. I don't know, five days or less, three, four days before uh, everything started. And it was a strange uh, feeling, you know, the days before the storm. Uh, everyone was uh, talking about it. Uh, everyone was expecting and there were someone, some people were saying between uh, Tuesday or and, uh, Thursday. So it was pretty clear that something is happening. But at the, the other, uh, on the other side, and I say this as a human being, uh, Everyone, even us, we were saying this, we knew that it was happening, we knew it consciously, but somehow you wouldn't uh, take it for granted. You hope, you, everyone would hope, would have hoped that something would happen at the last minute and that uh, or Putin might be stopped from this uh, crazy endeavor. Uh, I think this is just uh, a way that human beings uh, react because you cannot take for granted uh, the ugly face of the war until it is there. And uh, for us, uh, every, I would say that at least Eastern Europeans and for us in Romania, it was clear before, and I think also after the war started, that when it starts, it will take long. And uh, it, it's going to be ugly before it's going to be better. I don't know. I think, you know, in, in Germany, um, People hoped, many hoped that uh, it will, uh, it, it will probably be, um, can be stopped sooner. There were expectations that it will go differently, but for us, it was clear that Pandora box was opened and you wouldn't be able to, to close it very soon. And uh, here we are uh, seeing that at least our predictions and our expectations were, were right and uh, trying to encourage ourselves uh, to stick together and uh, to strengthen our uh, our resilience to what is still going on. Yeah, thank you so much, Adriana. And we come back to the issue um, of if we are doing enough um, on security and the EU um, in a second. Um, to all of you who do not know, um, jo um, Mircea Joana was just mentioned. Um, he is the Deputy uh, General, uh, Se Secretary General of the NATO. And I'm saying this because he's also um, the founder of Aspen Romania and very close to Aspen Romania still. So um, this is how um, the connections, by some of the connections are also so very strong, Mirela, between your institute and also NATO. Um, turning, um, giving the floor again to you, Pierre, um, how did you perceive those first days um, after the invasion? Um, and also, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how was the mood um, in Romania? Well, indeed, it, these were challenging times. In the run-up to the invasion, I think I, I share or I shared the sentiment that Adriana has described. You see what is coming, you, you read and hear what is developing on the ground. And nevertheless, you still want to believe that maybe there's a way out. But, but I mean, um, Russia has you know, long prepared apparently this move. Um, the year before, I remember very well, just the year prior to that, they had also large military exercises that raised a lot of concern, concerns in Western capitals where we felt like, okay, well, what, what is Russia doing? And then they sort of withdraw again with their, with their exercising troops, but the year later, obviously, they made a full move. The, the, the very first days after the invasion, indeed, um, had a, a, a very sad and sober atmosphere, in a sense, given that Romania was, of course, at the front line uh, from day one. The front line in the sense that it um, opened its uh, borders for numerous uh, refugees from Ukraine and managed, uh, I dare say, superbly this large influx that you couldn't really prepare for uh, in a fantastic cooperation between government, uh, civil society, NGOs that work hand in hand. And I feel that the border a few times 
to to see this uh, you know firsthand so to speak how well um, things were managed in a very pragmatic way which is a trademark for Romania if I dare say so a very pragmatic approach when it comes to taking action so this was um, um, good but of course uh, it showed you how close uh, the the war had moved um, it was necessary of course to assure one another within the EU and, and foremost within NATO that uh, we would stick together in protecting our allied territory. And um, I, in these days, I think those that might have um, questioned why Romania would be part of NATO uh, were, were the last ones were understanding what an outstandingly important fact this is that Romania and Bulgaria and the other Eastern European partners are part of NATO. That, um, that gives a, the best guarantee that we can have. Of course, you never have a 100% guarantee, but I think the fact that Romania is partnered, uh, partnered up with us in the Transatlantic Alliance is, is of utmost importance. And that was also felt in these first days. So overall, a very, well, how should I say, on one hand, depressing development. On the other hand, one where we even got moved closer together. And when I say closer together, I also, you know, can translate this specifically to a bilateral relationship between Germany and Romania. It's more as terrible as it is, this brutal Russian aggression, as despicable as it is, it has at least also caused us to close the ranks. And that is particularly true for Germany and Romania. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, thank you so very much for this, um, for this very differentiated um, answer and your insights. Um, now it's two years later, um, and uh, we are still in the war, um, and um, a lot of lives have been lost, um, people are really suffering. Um, there was a lot of support, but support, I mean, did come, um, maybe not always as fast enough and as uh, much enough. So I want uh, to ask you a follow-up question, Pear. Um, are we doing enough? Are we doing enough quickly enough? And is this perceived in Romania as enough? Well, we, we are doing a lot. Uh, and of course, there is still room for doing more and also a pressing need to do more. Now, given the setup that we have in our countries, we are democratic uh, societies and um, countries, political systems, you, you cannot, you know, uh, uh, rush through decision making uh, like a dictatorship might do, but we are much better off by having the institutions and the procedures in place that enable us to hear every voice in our society and to move ahead in a way that takes most of the voices aboard. So I think this is a value that just shouldn't be underestimated. But of course, there is so much more we need to do. When it comes to the situation in Ukraine right now, we all sense the tremendous need for beefing up the air defense because the Russians are strategically destroying the infrastructure by sort of trying to wear down the Ukrainian defense spirit. They are not, they don't, you know, see the possibility for themselves to just conquer uh, every square meter by having soldiers taking over this, this land. They don't have the, the, the capacity to do that, but they, have, they will, of course, want to break the will, the defense spirit of Ukraine by strategically pointing at these um, at infrastructural uh, crucial points. So this is why we need to beef up air defense. Germany has started a new initiative just recently where we also try to, to collect whatever is, is available within the allies. And I think there is room for more. Um, I think uh, we, 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 should, we should all ask ourselves, isn't there something else we could spare? Because if whatever we have in terms of defense capabilities, if it's placed, in Ukraine, it's not only protecting Ukraine, but it's also protecting us because it will stop the Russian aggression or at least slow it down. So that's why, uh, yes, of course, we need to do more. Thank you so much. Uh, Adriana, do you agree? <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, I do agree with the fact that we need to do more. And I think every one of us would agree with this, uh, with this thing, with this position. But um, more than that, I think we should also think at the same time what um, that we we've done um, we we uh, went a long way until us until now all of us and it is a process you know uh, when I look back to Romania per was mentioning the humanitarian aid but uh, it's also you know the uh, uh, serious uh, exports 
through Romania. I was uh, dealing with Eastern Europe when I, policies when I was in the ministry before I came here. And I can say from virtually, you know, almost no export uh, over Romanian territory from Ukraine, you reached uh, almost 50, 40 um, uh, millions of tons of grains which were exported over Romania. This means a lot of effort. I'm just giving an example. But of course, apart from that military, there is a lot of support. Romania is not uh, speaking publicly about this, but uh, we also do our best and try to improve. And I think this is uh, this is a priority which is already uh, seen and acknowledged at the EU level. We do work individually, bilaterally with Ukraine in Brussels as well to always search for ways to do more and to, to improve our commitment and our contribution. But it is clear it's not enough. I would say this as, uh, you know, as an individual, as an ambassador, so I have no uh, restriction in admitting that we need to do more. At the same time, as also Per was mentioning, we need to do this in uh, consensus with the society and with the process that we are going in. We fight all, Russia also directly, at least in the hybrid war. What Per was mentioning before, uh, these were um, developments which we witnessed in Romania for long. Romania, Republic of Moldova, so at least at our border, you know, this um, hybrid war, this uh, war of disinformation and of false narratives was ongoing for, for many years. Maybe we got a bit more resilient with ups and downs because we are used to this menace, if you want to go it this way and not go to harsher uh, terms, but uh, this doesn't make us safer. So uh, we do have also at the European level, we do have networks uh, at the NATO and the NATO framework, EU framework. We do have uh, networks for improving on, on a daily basis our defenses on all accounts in the, um, you know, in the European Union, NATO, and also supporting Ukraine. Yeah, thank you so much. Um... I think our Ukrainian um, friends would agree um, that um, more is necessary um, to um, to really counter Russian aggression um, on the ground, but also um, also on the cyber, um, with regard to the cyber realm, but also with regard to uh, disinformation. And um, I would now really very much like to bring in our audience. Um, and I saw that the first question was already posed in, um, in the uh, Q&A function. Um, and um, this is a question regarding uh, our EU treaties. It's a really not easy question. Um, we are facing so many external challenges. We need to do more um, with regard to defense. But we also heard that it is not so easy to um, find a common voice or a decision among 27 uh, countries. So do we have to change our treaties? Um, I also would like to bring in Klaus Wittmann. Um, he is a good friend of the Espen Institute Germany, and he is, has also just published, um, and this is now our little segment of advertisement, um, a wonderful spot on, <laughs> on, on Russia's war on Ukraine and German reaction and what needs to be done on, uh, about it. Um, and you can find this on our web uh, page. So um, I give you the floor, Klaus, and then I hand back to our two ambassadors. Am I am I on? You are I on. You, you had a question from the chat before, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I already brought it in. Um, okay. The treaty changing okay. the treaty. Um, uh, I uh, would like to uh, address both ambassadors, and of course, this also relates to what I call the subjugation war of Russia against Ukraine. Uh, but uh, I put the question in a different way, and I have to say that I personally am very critically of uh, very critical of what we do. I find these rankings. We are the second uh, uh, and so on uh, superfluous. In relation to the uh, to the uh, economic power, we are number 13, not number two. And uh, I uh, find that uh, the only decisive thing is what arrives at the front. And uh, this mantra, we help Ukraine as long as it takes, is not enough. It should be added, uh, should be complemented by, with all they need, 
and in a timely way. Now, uh, it is uh, understandable that Ambassador Gebauer, in a certain way, defends our decision making process, but I will show the color of my cards and then come to the question. I think our Chancellor arouses public concerns to which he then turns in order to uh, uh, public, uh, to justify what he calls his considerateness. And we have a habit of explaining to Putin what red lines we have set for ourselves instead of pointing out his limits. Uh, the long-range precision uh, um, um, systems Ukraine should have received a long time ago, and I think uh, the exclusion of Russian territory, well, until recently we were in line with the also very cautious uh, American uh, president, but which the uh, US now seems to have lifted, is wrong. Now, against this background, I would like to ask both ambassadors how do, even if you are diplomats, uh, how do you look at what your host country does for Ukraine? Mm -hmm. um, as always, Klaus, you're not asking the easiest questions. No. <laughs> um, so um, you, um, both of you, I mean, both questions were not so easy, but I'm very uh, confident that you find good answers to this. Um, Adriana, maybe we can start with you. Yes, it's um, very much okay for me. You know, on uh, regarding the change of the EU treaties, um, of course, I understand and uh, I do agree with the difficulties that we have and, and the processes in the EU and uh, that uh, the institutional process, the decision-making process should be improved. But at the same time, we should not forget that we do have uh, at the table 27 sovereign states. So they should all be comfortable, they should all be part of uh, implementing the decision. I'm personally, I'm not that much a uh, supporter of, of pressing um, uh, states and pushing or, or um, you know, the pressure, can, there can be a pressure, but it depends how, how far it goes. It helped in our case in uh, reforming uh, the, ju the judiciary, in um, strengthening the rule of law in Romania, it helped. But of course, it's always a political process that it depends on how much pressure you put on on, the, on people. And on the same time, you know that I cannot imagine a, a place where one uh, country would be outvoted uh, in um, accepting a new member in the EU, and then that country would have to work with this new member. So I would rather go on dialogue, consensus, at least on these capital things. I, this is at least my uh, my guess. But on the other side, there is a lot that can be done within uh, these treaties. There is uh, a working group at the level of the EU with, uh, which is uh, searching for ways to improve our modalities. Uh, Romania is also part of, of this group, and um, I, you know I'm I'm pretty sure that we would we would get to good results. Um, just changing the treaties or adopting new treaties, I personally wonder, uh, and it's also the position of my country, if it is the right time to do this now. You know, the process of negotiating a new treaty is very long and hard, and uh, sometimes citizens think, do we really need this uh, reform institutional process where you are concerned with yourselves? And not solve our problems. So this is a question that we always have to to have to bear in mind. Um, regarding the um, uh, the support of Germany towards uh, for for Ukraine, um, and I'm very happy to see um, Professor uh, Brigadier General Wittmann in in our round. I respect you a lot, and uh, of course we follow you in different uh, in different formats. And this is great to have you here. Uh, I would say that um, the way we, we look at it is something that I also mentioned a bit before. It's a process. Germany has gone a long way. And uh, I would say there are many people that I do respect and follow and sometimes agree with in Germany who would uh, represent uh, your, would put forward your position that Germany is not doing enough, that the position is of Germany is not uh, at, as it should be at, uh, in the ranking of the contributors. But uh, what, from my 
uh, and how am I seeing it is that uh, it is um, a process which I wouldn't have thought possible uh, two years ago when we started with 5,000 helmets. So, and, you know, it is a great process. It is moving on. We see Germany doing uh, a lot of uh, effort and getting involved in, in Lithuania. This is also needed and it helps, it strengthens our flag our NATO flag that we also belong to, and it strengthens our position close to Ukraine. So it is, I think it's on many accounts. I I had I find it hard to think only in mathematic rankings, because uh, as I said, it is a much more complex uh, process, and I'm really honored and happy to see it here, to, to observe and to report about uh, this transformation of, of Germany. Thank you. Uh, I would just simply directly take over, if you allow, uh, Somi. Um, on, on these two questions, uh, treaties, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much in sync there with, with Adriana. I think we uh, treaty reform is a very complex procedure, which often involves uh, in some countries a referenda, and it's um, something where you might, you know, uh, not focus on at this very moment. I think when, when it comes to treaty changes, if everybody else in Europe would opt for one, it wouldn't, you know, Germany, Germany wouldn't veto that. But at this point in time, we um, focus very much on those reforms that can be done within the existing treaties and there are a number of clauses in the existing treaty framework that enables us for example to move forward to majority voting by an unanimous vote and then future on you words you you vote by by a qualified majority so we should um, tap into the potential that is there treaty changes will be an issue once uh, the first uh, negotiate uh, the first um, accession treaties are to be ratified if the first negotiations are uh, closed and you will have to ratify in every member state the accession treaty and then of course you you might think of including also reform clauses but i mean we are not there yet and i think that's why everybody focuses on the changes possible within the existing framework um, support for Ukraine. Uh, let me start with, with Romania and also uh, with praising Romania for what it has done. Um, uh, we, a number of issues we've touched upon already. The, a very generous um, taking in of numerous refugees in the very early days of the uh, full-fledged Russian aggression was uh, an outstanding uh, achievement by Romania and, as I said, by the government in cooperation with NGOs and civil society that was um, really highly valued and cherished also in Berlin. The fact that Romania was a key actor when it came to enabling the grain export, Adriana has, met, uh, has um, um, uh, mentioned as well. Of course, the military aid that also Romania is providing to Ukraine, even though it's not really much talked about, but of course, Romania plays its role and is a reliable ally and partner. Uh, Romania has the longest named border with Ukraine when it comes to your member states. A lot of what other countries are sending to Ukraine obviously is also involving Romanian support, engagement, cooperation. So you cannot value high enough the role and the contribution that Romania has been given in this whole political context. Uh, a word in Germany, nevertheless, even though the question was, was uh, addressed <laughs> only to uh, Adriana. Um, uh, thanks, Adriana, for pointing out. I think it is a process. You're fully right. We have um, had a, a, a so-called Zeitenwende moment where we really had to adapt. And no country, no democratic country at least, is able to shift you know, from day one, 180 degrees. But I think we've come close to that. We've really moved ahead. And with regard to where Germany stands right now, um, I also wouldn't, you know, point out to any rankings, and you can have numerous rankings that have different uh, content, you know. But if you ask Ukraine today uh, about Germany's performance, you will hear that they are uh, tremendously grateful for what Germany is doing. And I think this is the best answer, you know, I can give you here from those that are directly, um, you know, affected and uh, benefit uh, from the support. So I feel that uh, we, we don't have to 
you know, blame ourselves too much here, but there is uh, an element where we can take some pride into having moved forward uh, uh, a long way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. There are so many other issues um, I would love to hear your opinion on, for example, if we have the same risk perception, if we read China the same way, um, and many other things which happen in, around the world. Our time is running up, however, so I would like to stay a little bit more um, for the last round on the European Union and enlargement. Um, and we talked um, about Ukraine, um, we heard about uh, Moldova, we heard about the Western Balkans. And uh, so I want to throw um, a question at both of you. Um, is how, how do we make the EU enlargement ready so that um, it is going to stay a success? <laughs> Pierre, do you want to start? <laughs> I, I, I can start, yeah. How do you make EU enlargement ready? Um, again, it's a, it's a number of aspects that we've um, um, slightly touched upon already. We need to make sure that uh, if we are more than our voting procedures uh, fit the higher number in a sense that we um, should and must avoid a situation where we just cannot uh, decide anything given that there's one or the other country vetoing. So this is a, a, a must. We need to uh, come to a understanding when it comes to finances. Uh, the funds are limited. Money is always limited. If you have new accession countries, there will be a redistribution of uh, programs when it comes to agriculture, cohesion funds, and so on. This needs to be discussed, clarified. That is, also, from my point of view, uh, it's just a very obvious uh, need. Um, and of course, we need to sort of come to um, also a better understanding where do we want to head, where do we see our future. This um, debate on finality of EU, I mean, I know it might be a theoretical issue, but um, there seems to be different views on what do we need EU for. Is it merely an economic club with, uh, without any customs, uh, so to speak, a, a customs union plus and a common market? Or do we also have a joint vision to where we want to arrive? I think it's also necessary to have a, a bit of an understanding on where we are heading. Um, so these, you know, just to make it short, are I think elements where we need to um, find a bit more answers on. Thank you so much. And Adriana, how do we make the EU enlargement ready? Yes, I would start a bit with a larger uh, approach. And I would say that uh, we need to uh, tell our people, our citizens, and to let them understand better what it is worth this enlargement and what it brings to us. You know, we said, marked uh, recently 20 years of the largest wave of, en of enlargement of the EU. Uh, Romania was not part, we started negotiations with uh, the other 10, but we uh, joined the EU three years uh, later. Uh, but still, we in Berlin, we celebrated together. You know, we had uh, an event. Uh, I saw Anya Quiring earlier from Ostauschus. Uh, she was one of our partner. And of course, we want to send this message. And of course, we are thankful for our um, friends from the economic field, but not all, only, also from the political area and from all walks of life, who um, will focus on the benefits for also for the old, you know, for the EU as such, and not only for the newcomers, because it brought benefits to all of us. So this is important first to have uh, the common understanding of what it was and remains worth for us to, to enlarge the EU. Then, um, you know, we do have, we speak a lot about reforming the EU to make it fit for the enlargement. We think that we would we will do this and we can do this when we come to the point of enlargement. We do not see a conditionality. And honestly, you know, if we reform now and uh, have new members or fit, put the new framework and then have new uh, members in five years, you never know what will be there. Uh, we didn't know that we will have to invest that much in defense some few years ago when we are still working on enlargement with the Western Balkans, that we will even talk about a uh, defense commissioner or a commissioner for defense and security, and defense industry, no matter how we frame it. So we didn't think about these things, but these are our concerns right now. Right now. So if we have the political understanding that uh, this enlargement is uh, good for us, then we can work on it and Parallel with that, we can change also the shape or the you know the functioning of our house. 
and yeah, uh, I'm uh, in good mood and really positive that we will succeed it because we need that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I couldn't agree more. We need this. Um, and I'm very happy to hear that you're optimistic um, about it, uh, that it can be achieved with everything which is going on around the world and in the EU. Sometimes, well, you could get a little bit of a pessimist, <laughs> but it's, um, yes. I want to add something, you know, we, at the uh, Munich Security Conference, the last one this, uh, this February, uh, we were along uh, many people, many politicians around one, you know, one round table. And uh, there was a lot of pessimism which was uh, shared in, in the room. And of course, a very bleak uh, view of uh, what is happening around, as you mentioned. But uh, my minister, maybe you know her, the Milica Odobescu, she's a lady. She said, you know, of course we know what the uh, future is, but we have to work on it. And you know, just trust at the end. At the end of the day, we will have results. So let's go. Let's get on business and uh, do progress step by step. Yeah, this is uh, so. This gives us optimism that we have to work on it. Thank you so much. Um, these are wonderful concluding words. Um, I won't let both of you off the hook yet, though, um, and throw a very last question at you. Um, our meetings um, and bringing together people from different countries is always also with the aim of getting to know each other a little bit more and also each other's countries a little bit more and to understand a little bit better how and why we are how we are. So what I wanted to ask you, Pear, what do you tell your um, Romanian friends what to read or what to watch to understand the Germans? What to read or what to watch? Wow, okay. Um, uh, given my uh, personal um, uh, well, enthusiasm for sports, I would always recommend that the watch football games to understand a bit about Germany. And of course, uh, drink beer and eat sausages. No, that might be too much of a stereotype. No, I think uh, we live in, in times where um, there is, in particular in Romania, already a wonderful, great understanding about Germany that has to do with the German minority being present here for many centuries. And of course, is a result of the fact that our two countries are closely connected by day-to-day -day exchanges. And of course, you know, in, in, in times of, of TV, internet, whatsoever, you, you, you know a lot about what's happening. You have issues where you need to explain a bit more when it comes to certain topics where we are not in sync, whether it's nuclear power or um, other aspects. But usually I do not sense that there is a, a gap of understanding for Germany here in Romania. I think the understanding of Germany is, is, is quite high. Mm. Thank you so much. But still, we would join you for a good soccer game and a beer. And uh... Absolutely, and some sausages. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Adriana, what do you tell your German friends? So, uh, yes, recommending uh, books uh, or movies about Romania to be a hard thing to do at this moment. I did it in the past. You know, I'm um, more than 25 years in diplomacy. But uh, at that time, uh, Romania was not that much known. I would say that uh, now is not. I do not need to recommend a history book or uh, you know movies that would uh, encapsulate everything about Romania because um, Germans know us, so the German society knows us. Not always for the best. That's uh, sometimes a problem. But uh, you know, being in the EU, we are closer, and uh, there there are impressions about Romania. What I think um, it is important is for them to to go and see Romania to see us as we are. So this is what uh, I'm always uh, telling uh, our German counterparts, friends, you know, acquaintances, all our partners, go and see us, you know, just choose a topic and go and see what you discover about this topic in Romania, be it landscape being, you know, we had uh, Timisoara, the capital culture, uh, the cultural capital of Europe last year, or uh, Sibiu Hermannstadt who was uh, cultural capital of Europe in 2007 or you know the Danube Delta or monasteries uh, or just go to Bucharest and uh, see the life and uh, see the environments and sometimes have the impression that is very similar to Berlin. You know, this eclectic uh, spirit of, of the city, which I'm also seeing here. So just go and see for yourself. And I never uh, found uh, a person who was disappointed about uh, this experience. 
So this is always what I'm recommending and the word of uh, thank you to Per again, because they uh, he sees it's uh, the same and he's bringing a lot of, um, of politicians, uh, journalists, uh, you know, interested uh, people uh, to, to Romania. Um, people in the German business already discovered us and, uh, you know, they are thrilled. This is what I'm always perceiving, but uh, you, you need to, to have more visitors uh, be it by, for tourism or business. And you know, this is a problem sometimes also with the Eastern uh, European members that always we look to Brussels, you know, to Berlin, to Paris, London, so to the big capitals, but you know, the travel in the other direction is um, traditionally more limited. So here I think that uh, Fer is doing a, a great job. And again, thank you mm. for that. Thank you so Thanks, much. <laughs> <laughs> and I can only add, um, if you're going to Romania, also visit the Espen Institute. <laughs> and with this, I thank uh, both of you very, very much. And I hand over again to Mirella, um, Mirella for some um, last and final words. Just a warm thank you to all of you. Of course, Your Excellencies Stormy for the wonderful moderation. Um, Dr. Wittmann for the questions. Uh, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. I would be pleased to welcome all of you to Bucharest for sure, uh, to both our premises and to most of our public events. And of course, thank you Stormy for praising the NATO Youth Summit in the beginning. It was a common effort together with all um, Aspen uh, partners around the world and especially with the Aspen Institute uh, in the US. Uh, and uh, on that note, looking forward to seeing you all maybe at the Bucharest Forum, which is our flagship event it, this October on the 10th and 11th of uh, October. Uh, please let me know if you'd like to join uh, and uh, hope to lead on the very promising cooperation between Romania and Germany uh, with your attendance in our future events. Thank you so much, Stormy and Aspen Germany team once again. Thank you so much. And what I forget to say, join us for our summer reception next uh, Thursday um, in the Remise in Berlin. Um, we are going to discuss the future of Europe um, with Anton um, Hofreiter um, and Lynn Zell. So that should be um, interesting and maybe also a little entertaining. And we will have lots of opportunity to network. So thank you so much again um, to all of you, to our uh, two ambassadors, to Mirella. And um, with this, we conclude our meeting. And I uh, hope to see all of you soon again. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Bye. Bye.